There we go. There we go. It's never, it's never the sound booth's fault. It's always the preacher's fault. <laughs> At least with me, <clears throat> I was pushing a button, but obviously it was the wrong button. Well, good morning. So good. So good to be with you. It's always good to be back here. My wife, Lorraine, is here for the second service, which is always good for me. She's the, she's the high road of us. She's the better part of us. So, But it's so good. And I'm glad that um, Brother Harold learned that new word this week, vacation. And it's good that you encourage that. It's good for your pastor to get away from time to time and refresh and regroup. And so that's good. And I appreciate, I love your pastor. Brother Harold and I go back a long way, and he's just, he's just a dear friend, and I'm so grateful for him. And, it, and it's an honor to serve as your director of missions here in Comanche Cotton Association. Uh, I'm going to give you two scriptures this morning that we're going to read to kick us off, and then we'll obviously cover some more. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And then... Uh, what God says through the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17. So Genesis chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 5.17. While you're looking there, and I, know, I think it's in your bulletin, I know y'all are promoting this, but I just want to put a plug in for the Walk of Life coming up, uh, put on by the, uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center, which is a, a jewel for us right here in Lawton area, um, to either get a team together sponsor someone, be a part of it. It's coming up quick. I know my wife, Lorraine, works down there. She's the assistant to the director. And so, but it's, and that's not why I'm saying this. this the, these folks, this is a frontline ministry, ministering to mamas and babies and families and daddies. And so um, be in prayer about that. It's a great event. So why Genesis chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians 5.17? This morning, I want us to look at the amazing and miraculous work of God as God of creation and the God of redemption. And God creates everything in Genesis chapter 1. When he's done with it, he says it's good, it's perfect. But then we know that Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin against the holy God. They fall to sin, sin enters in, and then... God's word is the story of redemption. So, But what I want us to see this morning is the miraculous, creative working of God as he walked us through this account of creation There's, is, is the parallels to what he does to us, a sinner separated from a holy God, when he saves us. So I just want us to look at, at the parallels and the connections between the creation and the redemption. So... Uh, we're going to read the first two verses, verses in Genesis 1 to kick us off. This is what God's Word says. In the beginning, God. God what? God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, meaning there was nothing but darkness. It was just blackness. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And we're going to talk a little more about that in a minute. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 is this glorious declaration uh, of the God of redemption. It says here, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, any man, any woman, any child, anyone who comes to a saving faith, through repentance and faith in Jesus, the gospel, what's it say? He's a new creation. Do you see the parallel right off the bat? It's the same language. It's the same Genesis language. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So what has happened there? Well, Paul says the old has passed away, been covered, been done away with. Behold, that's that word that we see in the Greek language oftentimes at the birth of Christ of when God's fixing to declare something, behold, it's like, pay attention, I have an announcement. The new has come. So, 
Let's take a look at these parallels that we see in the creation account and we also see in the redemption account of man. The word for God here in Genesis 1, verse 1, is the Hebrew word Elohim, which encapsulates, describes God's creative power, his supreme authority, and his sovereignty over his creation. It's a singular pluralistic, meaning it's referring to the one true God, but the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see God mentioned here. We see the Holy Spirit is hovering. And if you go to John chapter 1, what does this say? In the beginning, same Genesis language, was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's he talking about there? Jesus. So we have this beautiful thing going on over top this beautiful mess. The word created is the Hebrew word for God created. The word created is the Hebrew word, word bara. And it means to create out of nothing. We do not have the ability, man does not have the ability to bara, to create. It actually means to create something that never existed before. Now I want you to think of the beauty of that word when, when we're looking at the God of creation, the Elohim God creating everything out of nothing, but then also what happens when a lost person gets saved. It's not that God makes you a better you. It's not that God makes you a more improved you. That's called morality. No, no, no. When I'm, I'm not going to say you. I'm going to say me. When God saved my soul, he took what was not there and created something out of nothing. He allowed me through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus Christ, to be made new. It's like when a new car rolls off the Ford assembly line, the Chevy assembly line, or whatever assembly line you, you tether to. We say it's a new vehicle. It's not a new vehicle. It's, it, it, th that's not the new that Barra is talking about. So anyway, so we have this. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth, created everything that never existed into existence. Charles Spurgeon made this statement that when God saves a man and makes him or her a new creation, it's even a greater work than when God created everything in Genesis 1. Listen to what he says. My brethren, in our hearts, while there was nothing that could help God, but many things to hinder God, such as our stubborn wills, our deep prejudices, our ingrained love for iniquity, all of these, yes, great God, oppose you. But it was you, great God, to make a world, but it was even greater, O oh, you, great God, to create a new person in Christ. It's this beautiful God of creation, God of redemption. So whether we're talking about God creating everything or whether we're talking about him taking a lost sinner and bringing him from death to life in Jesus, we're talking from God, from start to finish, it is God. This world did nothing to speak itself into existence. God did it all. I did nothing to make myself right with a holy God, but it was by God's grace through faith and repentance in Jesus. Now, I told the first service this. If you want, this is my opinion, but if you want uh, um, the perfect definition of the gospel, the good news, the angelio, 
You can't find a better wording than second than um, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. Here's, here's, here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and three days later was raised to life in accordance to the scripture. That's the gospel. The Aeongelio. So what I want us to do in the time we have left is to look at these parallels between the God of creation and creation and the same pattern God uses when you and I are born again through Christ. First of all, this morning, notice the state of disorder mentioned here in Genesis 1-2. The state of disorder. What does it say again? The earth was without form. It was void and darkness covered the face of the deep or the face of the waters. So what is that telling us? It says, first of all, there's confusion. The earth, the earth was without form. There's no, that, that, that phrase means there's no order, there's no harmony, there's no connection with the ultimate plan of God. There's nothing perfect yet. It's just this confusion. It's the same thing when a person is lost. Before I came to a saving faith in the truth of who Jesus was, my life was just nothing but a confusion. But secondly, notice, it tells us there was an emptiness there. It says, and it was void. Now this word, if you don't get anything else this morning, this is one of the most beautiful pictures of the character of what God does. Void here in Genesis 1-2 means unable to produce anything good or purposeful. It means to be fruitless. So this state of disorder, there was this, it had no, and nor did my life before Jesus. There was nothing good in me, Paul says, at least according to my flesh. Nothing good in me, nothing fruitful in my life, no purpose in my life. It was void of anything good. James tells us in James 1 verse 16 through 18, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. If it be not for God, there be no good at all. He goes on to say, James does, of his own, uh, of his own will, he, God, Elohim, brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then in Romans 7, 18 is where Paul says, For I know, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Listen to what Paul says. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That was me. In my lostness and in my sin, I had no ability to even please a holy God, to do anything fruitful or anything good. So we have confusion, we have emptiness, but here's the sad word. The Bible says, and there was darkness over everything. There was darkness over the face of the waters. There was nothing but darkness until you get to verse 3. And God breaks through the darkness and says, God says, and let there be light. That was what my life looked like before Jesus. It was darkness until the gospel came. There's nothing but darkness in us until the light of the gospel is sent forth to us. Jesus says in John 12, 46, I have come, watch this, I have come as light into the world. 
so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Do you see the parallel? Do you see before Jesus and after Jesus? Do you see the creation of God, the power of God, Elohim, and then the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his glorious resurrection that we just we just celebrated? And the Bible teaches us, not the world, but the Bible says to be lost in sin is to be under the control or domain or power of darkness. Acts 26 verse 18, it says, it says, open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this is the description. There was God, and then there was this state of disorder until he begins to do what only God can do. There was confusion, there was emptiness, there was darkness And that's the same state of a person without Christ. I don't care what they look like on the outside. I don't care what their profile on Facebook makes them appear to be. Inside, I know for me, it was just this confused empty darkness and I was miserable so the first thing we notice is the state of disorder the second thing we notice is the work of the Holy Spirit in the creation account as well as the work of the Holy Spirit to bring a person to salvation look at the last part of verse 2 and the Spirit of God Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, was hovering over the face of the waters. This is beautiful. The King James puts it this way. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is the activity of God over this state of disorder. This Hebrew word here, moved, means fluttered lovingly. I want you to get this image. This confused, empty, dark thing, the Holy Spirit moves upon it and is just fluttering and hovering over it, just waiting for the Elohim to say, go. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered your children together as hens gather her brood under her wings. This language in Genesis 1-2 is the same language as in Deuteronomy 32-11. Listen to this. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up and carrying them upon their pinions. It was metaphorically used when the priest would take the cup or the chalice and wave his hand over top of it to consecrate it before the Eucharist or before the love feast? Yeah, so the world may rotate. And men may walk about. And churches may be so full of activity. But the Bible teaches... It's not until the Holy Spirit moves upon the creation that anything of God takes place. And I've got good news for somebody this morning. From this viewpoint, you all look good. You all look happy. You all look healthy. But aren't you glad God sees inside of you? God saw me. So here's a good word for you. The Holy Spirit loves messes. The Holy Spirit loves messes. Because God's got the ability that we don't have. 
to do an amazing, miraculous thing in our life. So we must pray as a church family for a mighty moving of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit of God. So we see this state of disorder. We see the work of the Holy Spirit. The third thing I want you to see is the power of God's Word. The power of God's Word. Eight times, eight times in the creation account, we read, and God said, and God said, and God spoke, and God spoke. Eight times the power of God's word. God spoke and it was, God spoke and it was done. One source put it this way, God created the heavens and the earth, then working through an orderly process of divine design, he brought forth his glory. Isn't that good? I wish I'd have said that. Now, we don't have time this morning to go into a deep dive into the the actual creation account, but I'll give you this. God formed his creation in days one through three, and then he filled his creation in days four through six. The forming was accomplished by three acts of separating and sorting various elements of what he created. And then the filling was carried out by five acts of populating what God had created, all by the power of just God speaking it. I love, last year Lorraine and I had the privilege, all my lands, of going to Israel. I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. We stood atop of the valley of Armageddon where the big battle is going to happen at the end of times. Where Satan's going to draw all the forces and all the armies to stand up against God. And I love what the word of truth says. Jesus is going to step out and just speak a word and it's going to be over. This is the God who created us. This is the God who redeemed us. He just has to speak a word, and it is. Why do we fear? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 is so valuable to me, I think. I'm going to personalize it for you. And if you know Jesus Christ in salvation, you can too. Troy belongs to Christ. And Troy is a brand new creation. All the old stuff in Troy's life has been done away with. Behold, Troy, the new has come. And that new is Jesus. So we have the state of disorder. We have the work of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God's word. Fourthly, we see this divine. Now, when I normally preach this, which I've only preached it like three times, it's like a four-part series. So I'm t- you're getting all the straws, so I'm trying to be quick. But now we see God begin to sort and separate things, and we see the same thing after God saves someone. Look what it says in in verses 4 through 6. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So you read all the way down through verse 9, and we see God separating and sorting that which he created. We see the very same thing that happens after a person is saved. We call it sanctification. What does the word to sanctify or phrase mean? It means to set aside for the purposes of God. To separate, to sort, to set aside 
because it's holy. When Jesus saved my soul, God began to do this intricate separating and sorting and sanctifying in my life. It wasn't me. I just had this new innate desire because of the filling of the Holy Spirit to love God and to serve God and to follow God. I'm not saying I understood it all, but I had a desire to. And so he began to separate me and sort me from the things that wouldn't bring him glory. Quit walking there. Begin to walk here. Don't look down. Have your head up. Things like that. Because it brings God glory that we're saved and now set apart for him. Jesus, in this priestly prayer in John chapter 17, listen to what Jesus says to the Father. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Isn't that amazing? When you get saved, you get a new address. When you get saved, you get a new everything. We are now just pilgrims and sojourners and passing throughs. We go from, from brick and mortar to a spiritual tent. Because one day, oh, we're going home. We're going home. This world is not our home. So Jesus says, Father, they're now not of the world just like I'm not of the world. So what's he say? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. Set them aside for your glory. Now this amazing thing begins to happen. Up until this point, there was no fruit. And we see in the creation account that fruit begins to spring forth. It's the same thing in a lost person's life. Now because of Jesus, because of salvation, because of the gospel, because of the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, my life can now bear fruit for God. If for just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it, but if you read Genesis 1, verses 11 through 13, all of a sudden God begins to speak and vegetation begins to sprout and the fruit trees begin to bear fruit according to its seed and according to its kind. What's that look like in the life of a believer? The Holy Spirit begins to bear fruit through your life. That's why we're warned, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. I love what Paul says in Galatians 5. He, he talks about the fruit of the flesh or the works of the flesh is this, 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 and this. But he says, oh, but the fruit of the Spirit is, when I got saved for the first time in my life, the Holy Spirit did this in my life. Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then God says, and there's no law that can come against that. Because the born again has in Christ Jesus crucified the flesh to its passions and to its desires. It's amazing, isn't it? And I'm going to close with this. I don't want to close, but I'm going to close. I'm from West Virginia. It's like a good piece of bologna. You just got to cut it off <laughs> somewhere, right? So we see this state of disorder. We see the moving of the Holy Spirit. We see the power of God's Word. What's the next one? We see the separation and the sanctification We see fruit bearing, and then finally we see God do something really amazing. He begins to position the light where he wants it to be. If you read <clears throat> verses 14 through 19 is where you're going to get into the positioning of the lights. God begins to hang the stars exactly where they need to be. He separates the moon from the sun so that, so that this light illuminates his creation just the way he wants it to be illuminated. God sets the lights above his creation to shine upon his creation. It's the, it's, it's the showing of his glory. Guess what God does when he saves you? 
He positions you as well. It's called your witness. Let me remind you of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He says, you are the light of the what? World. A city city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they set it high upon a stand so that it gives light to all who are in the house. But then I love this. Jesus says, listen to me. Listen to me, my children. Likewise, let others see your light, your works, your witness. And so it'll be unmistakable that they'll turn themselves towards me who is in heaven. We are to shine positionally wherever God has placed us. It's our witness. It's how we bring God glory. Get rid of this attitude. It doesn't matter how I live. Yes, it does matter how we live. It matters. It's, it makes the difference in everything how we live because it brings God glory. I hate to do that. This is the saddest sound. I don't know. I don't know where you're at today. And I don't even pretend to know. In fact, I, but God does. Your life could be a royal mess this morning, but hallelujah, the Holy Spirit loves messes. You may have never come into a saving, genuine, born again birth with Jesus Christ. You've been religious your whole life. You've been faithful to church and maybe faithful to read your But we're talking about, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. There's going to be a lot of bad people in heaven and a lot of good people in hell because that's not what makes the difference. Jesus makes the difference. He's the bar. So I don't know where you're at. But I know one thing based on the authority of God's word. God does and God can and God will. If you'll just say yes to Christ this morning. Or maybe you're a born again believer but God's still sorting. Hey, let me, let me tell you something. You will never reach that place that you think you're going to reach until you walk into glory. God is forever going to be shaping and molding and sanctifying and sorting and all that Maybe he's doing a little bit of that in your life right now. Pruning, whatever. I don't know, but again, this is God we're talking about. Elohim, all authority, all power. He can do anything. Dr. Adrian Rogers said, this time of invitation is simply a time where God does business with people who mean business. So if you mean business this morning with a holy, righteous God who knows everything and can change everything, I promise you, you will not leave the way you walked in. And that's not hype. That's truth. Father, in Jesus' name, precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. The name upon which every knee one day is going to bow, either submissively right now or forcibly down the road. But it's in that name we come to you in prayer, Father, by faith, believing that you're God, believing that you're creator, believing that you're the God of redemption in Christ Jesus and the gospel. My prayer this morning, Holy Spirit, is that you would move across the face of this place and over the surface of our hearts and just do what it is that only you can do we love you father we leave this with you and we ask it in jesus name amen would you stand with us